presentation is scheduled. This presentation is scheduled for an hour, which will be followed by approximately 30 minutes of Q&A. You can submit your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during this presentation or during the Q&A section. For a little background on Sonoma Land Trust, for those of you who might not be as familiar with Sonoma Land Trust, the Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 58,000 acres of land in the county thus far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thank you all for helping us protect Sonoma County for future generations. As we pursue our mission in conserving land in Sonoma County, we also recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral land of many indigenous people. We honor their knowledge, care, and stewardship of this special place across ages and acknowledge their deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their culture and traditional connections to the land. Thank you again for joining us tonight and we're excited to begin our presentation. Soundscapes to Landscapes is a science-based project that seeks to advance monitoring of animal biodiversity across large areas using audio recorders, earth observing sensors, and artificial intelligence. In this special presentation, we will hear from a panel of Soundscapes to Landscapes members about their innovative approach and some of their findings thus far. It's my pleasure now to introduce our four presenters this evening. Dr. Matthew Clark is a professor in the Geography, Environment, and Planning Department at Sonoma State University. He has a PhD in Geography from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and an MS in Conservation and Ecosystem Analysis from the University of Washington. He teaches classes in Geographic Information Systems and Remote Sensing. His research is focused on novel forms of remote sensing including satellites, airplane sensors, drones, for monitoring biodiversity, assessing land change, and helping conservation and land management. Next is Dr. Leo Salas. Dr. Salas is a quantitative ecologist in the Ecoinformatics and Climate Solutions Group at Point Blue Conservation Science. Originally from Venezuela, he obtained his MS in, in wildlife conservation and PhD in um, organismic and evolutionary biology from the University of Massachusetts. He has worked with a variety of organisms and ecosystems and specializes in novel data analysis methods and modeling biological systems at large spatial and temporal scales, including future climate scenarios. Next is David Leland. David is a member of the Audubon Society and Redwood Regional Ornithological Society. He has been on the Soundscapes to Landscapes team since 2017, participating in community outreach, field placement of recorders, analysis of recordings to identify bird species presence, development of models for individual species of interest. In addition, he is also working with his Sonoma Valley community on ways to reduce carbon emissions. Last but certainly not least is Rose Snyder. Rose is a science strategist at Point Blue Conservation Science and is the project coordinator for Soundscapes to Landscapes. Her primary focus is on public outreach, citizen science coordination, and field season planning, including gaining access to sites, recruiting and training citizen scientists, and data processing and management. When she's not at her desk or out in the field, Rose enjoys spending time with her toddler and working in her vegetable garden. With that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Matt, Leo, David, and Rose. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Do you see my slides okay? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hi, good evening. Hey, thank you for having us, Sonoma Land Trust. Um, I just want to give a shout out to um, Sonoma Land Trust right at the get-go here because they've helped us right from the beginning of our project. We started in 2017, um, and so it's been many years in the works here, um, but they've helped us get access to, to land um, and putting out our recorders, which we'll be talking about. Um, sometimes the stewards themselves put out the recorders, and other times we had citizen scientists, volunteers go and put recorders out on their property. And um, as we'll show in our talk here, we're gonna have some results hot off the press um, for Glen Oaks Ranch, uh, a Sonoma Land Trust property that some of you might have, might have gone to already. Um, and I just wanna, with that said, that's like a big caveat here is some of the results we're showing are preliminary. And so we're working on this. This is iterative science and we keep improving things um, in this whole, this whole system that we're building. But at the high level, uh, Soundscapes to Landscapes is a biodiversity monitoring project. It's funded by NASA. It's in their Citizen Science for Earth Systems program. So they specifically uh, wanted projects that involve citizen scientists, which are volunteers. We'll hear more about those uh, people involved in the project. And David's one of those. Um, and I, another thing about this project is that it's very collaborative. It involves um, you know, citizen scientists, volunteers, as well as researchers at universities and nonprofits like Point Blue and Pepperwood, um, as well as some of our local land agencies like Ag and Open Space. So it's been a lot of moving parts. It's a work in progress. We're in the phase right now of winding down the data collection part with citizen scientists and working on the science piece that involves NASA assets, remote sensing, and um, writing our papers and getting them out. So that's where we're at. Um, okay, so let's just get into it. Um, so the main motivation behind Soundscapes to Landscapes is this underlying biodiversity crisis that we're in. Um, you know, this is a, a many different species, different taxonomic groups. In this project, we're particularly focused on birds. Um, and birds uh, populations, there's a new study that just came out a couple of years ago that found just in North America alone, that bird population abundance or abundances of birds is down 30% since the 1970s. So you know, we're losing species globally, but and then also abundances are declining and putting species at risk of, of extinction. So, you know, this is affecting again a lot of different species. Um, we'll be mainly talking about birds, but all of this uh, in terms of monitoring and the science of looking at how biodiversity is changing over time and affected by things such as habitat loss and climate change, all of that science relies on uh, data from the field of actual observations of, of biodiversity. And you know, this is logistically difficult um, to collect these kinds of data. Um, you know, with birds, you would go out in the field, you would listen for birds and, and hopefully cite some birds and then mark down your data on a, maybe a piece of paper. Maybe you're out, for 10 to 15 minutes at a site and trying to make, you know, make an accounting of the birds that are, that are observed there. So it's very limited in time and it's very limited in space. Um, and then also, you know, you need expertise uh, to be able to collect these kinds of on the ground data. Um, and there's, there's a real lack of, of people that are available to do this. Now birds are a special group because there's a lot of bird enthusiasts or birders as we call them out in the community that love birds and know how to both cite and listen to, you know, hear bird vocalizations and identify them. And those are the kind of people we're tapping in this project. Um, and, but ultimately we need lots more data from the ground if we're gonna be able to scale to, you know, a state level or globally, you know, regional levels, uh, looking at change in biodiversity. We do this in um, with what we call remote sensing, which is, using imagery from satellites or other kinds of data from, from a satellite or from an airplane or even from drones that can cover large areas. And then we relate data on the ground at locations that we've been to on diversity and, and relate that to the imagery, the remote sensing data. And then we can make maps at, at broader spatial scales. And also since these different kinds of remote sensing data track through time, we can make maps of change over time over large you know, broad areas. 
So, you know, there's a data paucity. This is not acknowledged in the scientific community. And so one of our innovations in this project was to look to some new technology to help us get on the ground data. And um, so that brings us to our solution. And there's a whole chain of different technological innovations at work here. But at the base of this project um, it is, um, you know, citizen scientists putting out these little sound recorders. They look like uh, little circuit boards, but they actually have a mic embedded. And um, we leave them out in the landscape for a few days. Uh, we record sounds. And then we run this through acoustic analysis where we represent the sounds as images. And we find representative bird vocalizations as well as other sound components. Um, and we use artificial intelligence um, and use that technology to identify in the sounds different bird species as well as other sounds. Um, so that's all very automated. Um, and then once we have those data uh, from each location, we can uh, connect that with the remote sensing data and make maps, uh, what we call species distribution models, um, which are basically spatial maps of where we think different species occur across the landscape. So all of these um, components that I'm talking about right now, I'm just giving you a broad brush overview with this slide of where we're going with this talk. And my other partners here on the call are gonna give you some more in-depth um, information on each of these pieces. And I'll be coming back uh, later um, to tell you about where we're going with the science. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Rose who's gonna explain uh, the different components of a soundscape. Yeah, so our project is called Soundscapes to Landscapes. Um, so what exactly is a soundscape and, and what does it consist of? Um, so a soundscape contains all of the sounds in the environment. This can include animal sounds, animal made sounds like insects and birds. Um, we call this biophony. It can include abiotic natural sounds like running water or wind. This is called geophony. And then there's human made sounds as well, of course, and that's any machinery or just conversations amongst humans or airplanes, um, and that's anthropony. And then in this project, we have a fourth category that we've used that we call quiet. And this is where there is an absence of sound detected in a recording um, at any given moment in time when it's run through our, um, our machine algorithm. Next slide. So our project mostly focused on identifying birds in the soundscape, um, although we have some done some of some work with some of those broad, broader categories of sound as well, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. Uh, but right now, we just wanted to take take a moment to listen to a short clip, about thirty seconds long, of an example soundscape from our recordings. Um, so we chose one specifically that is heavy on birds, so it has a lot of birds in it. Um, since our project does have a strong bird focus. So if, if there are any avid birders out there, definitely take a close listen and, and see if you can identify any of the species. Uh, all right, here we go. So we heard a lot happening in that really short clip. Um, so if, if you missed some of the birds, don't feel bad. Um, we heard in there a red-shouldered hawk. We heard a Pacific Slope flycatcher, a Cassin's vireo, morning dove, a, a warbling vireo, chestnut back chickadee, and a Western tanager. So as you can see, there's a lot that we can hear in, in this one short clip, one soundscape. All right, next slide. So we're now gonna listen to the same clip, but we're gonna add in the visual representation of the sounds. Um, so what we're seeing on the screen right now is called a spectrogram. And this is where the X axis is time, uh, the Y axis is frequency, and then the sounds are visualized as those lighter colors on the contrasting background. 
Um, and in Southscapes to Landscapes, this visual representation, the spectrogram, is what we use to train the computer to identify birds and sounds in the recordings. Um, and we'll get more into that soon. Uh, but for now, let's just take a listen and a look. Great, so you can see that by combining the visual with the audio, we now have even more information to use to identify species and other sounds by their visual pattern as well as by their vocalization. Uh, next slide. So as, as Matt sort of briefly mentioned, um, Soundscapes to Landscapes is, is very strongly a citizen science oriented project or community science oriented project. Um, so we worked really closely with citizen scientists over the course of the project and field work in particular we, um, was largely driven by the efforts of citizen scientists. And we had sort of a, a wide range of, of folks we called citizen scientists. We had local community volunteers who were just interested in helping out. Um, we also had college students who completed internships for academic credit and then we also considered property owners to be citizen scientists um, for a lot, you know, for allowing us to place place um, recorders on their property. So to record this, the soundscapes that we captured, we used this device called the Audio Moth. Um, that's the second picture there. Oh, and it's this, just this low cost, small, and easy to deploy audio recorder. You just flip it on with a switch of a um, flip of a switch. And these were hung in these simple uh, zip, zipping plastic pencil bags, super low tech. Um, you can see it in the photo on the right there with the, with the smiling volunteer. Um, and these audio mods, we deployed them at each site for three to four days during the breeding bird season. And they were programmed to record one out of every 10 minutes. Um, and, and so about, 90% of Sonoma County, which was our study area, is privately owned. So we did use a kind of a two-pronged approach to getting some broad sp spatial coverage across the county to make sure we really got good distribution um, geographically across the county. And, we, uh, and so with this first method, what we called the mail deploy approach, we shipped packages with, with the audio mods and instructions to property owners, and they actually did the setup on their own property and then mailed the audio mod back after a few days after it had been out. Um, and then what we the second method that we used, we called volunteer deployments, and that was when um, citizen scientists went out to both public and private properties to deploy and retrieve the audio mods. Um, and although mail deploy maybe took a few more resources, like just because of the cost of shipping and some slower turnaround on devices. Uh, it really was critical in filling geographic gaps across the county on private properties that we wouldn't otherwise have had access to. And so ultimately we found that this approach, um, this kind of two-pronged approach was very effective. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to my colleague, Leo. Thank you, Rose. Um... And so what was, uh, what was the effort? Um, how, how much uh, sampling did we do? Well, the map on the right uh, has a bunch of gray dots and some are turning to blue dots. Um, and that, that is a, a map of Sonoma County, basically. The colors in the map indi indicate the type of, of uh, cover on, on the land. So agricultural pasture is kind of light uh, or yellow kind of, uh, light brown, urban is dark brown, and so on, right? Um, each one of those grayish dots is a survey location, a survey site, where one of these devices was put. And in that graph, you will see, and you see the total at the bottom of the slides there, saying that we had uh, 1,286 sites, so 1,286 sites were surveyed as part of this project. The, the blue dots is because when these uh, white dots overlap, 
uh, the, the, the density becomes uh, higher and then the color switches from, from gray to blue. So you see some areas that were more intensely sampled. We're gonna get to that in a second. Um, so now let's switch to the graph, the bar graphs on the left. And let's start with the one at the bottom, the green one, uh, the, that shows how many sites we surveyed every year. And you will see that there are two groups, groups of bars there. One says prototype for years 2017 and 2018, and then implementation for 19, 20, and 21. Um, that prototype year is a year where NASA gave us money to test this, to say, hey, go out there and see if it works. Uh, it was supposed to be only one year, but uh, NASA being a federal agency, there were delays in the funding, getting to Sonoma State. And so we, we had to make do with what we had and managed to uh, span that prototype to two years, those are 17 and 18. And that's why the number of sites surveyed that, that year were low, were, was a lower number. Um, and these mostly happen in the Mark West watershed. And that happens to be one of those high density uh, um, areas there where the blue dots are. But then uh, once we convinced NASA that this was actually working, they you know, uh, funded the full implementation and we started that in 2019. And you see, we almost surveyed 400 sites that, that year. That's like four times, nearly four times what we did in 2017. Um, then in 2020, we're supposed we're ready to go. We're you know contacting everybody. Uh, Rose did a, an amazing job in setting it up, uh, and then the virus came, and we had to <laughs> cut back. And that gave us uh, we managed to collect uh, data from 200 sites, or about 200 sites that year. But uh, last year, uh, we were already ready with protocols, safety protocols regarding COVID, no, no people, no two people in a car, all sorts of stuff, mask, everyone wearing a mask, et cetera. So we went back to nearly normal uh, implementation. And that, last year, we, we hit it out of the park. We collected data from nearly 500 sites that year. So how does this trans translate to minutes of recordings? That's the graph the, with the blue bar, the one of the top left. And you can see there that um, um, the first two years, we collected around 50, uh, 70, 75,000 minutes in each one of those years. But the next years, we collected a lot more. And in total, we managed to collect uh, nearly 750,000 minutes of recordings. That's a lot of data to process. And, and this is where um, machines get, get to help. Um, because there's no way, there's no manpower enough for us to listen to these recordings and annotate what birds were there. Uh, there's no expertise enough. So then uh, what we did, and, it's, and this is where David comes to, to help and he's gonna jump in here in a second, is basically uh, also seek the help of citizen scientists and using those spectrograms and technologies that David is about to explain to you, we managed to extract information to train machines. So I'm going to pass this on to David now, and then I'll come back and see what the machines did. Go ahead, David. David, are you muted? How's that? Good. So now we have a wealth of recordings, which we stored in the cloud on a platform called Arbimon, which was built especially for storing and analyzing soundscape data. Because Arbimon isn't just a tool, uh, a file cabinet, but it's also a toolbox for extracting information from both individual clips and groups of clips and recordings, we were able to use it to process and understand our data set. Uh, early on, we simply tag recordings with boxes around vocalizations of interest adding the species name, as you can see here in the, in the lower right. Uh, this is another uh, one minute recording, just as Rose described, uh, with time on the x-axis and frequency on, on the y. So we put these boxes that are in green around vocalizations that we were interested in, uh, added the species name, and also created a checklist indicating species presence or absence. 
Um, one of the things that we learned really soon was that we could look at the spectrogram and identify birds much more quickly by eye than we could by ear and with excellent accuracy. Our workhorse tool in Arbimon, uh, which I'll get to in a second here, was pattern matching, where we selected an example or a template of a bird sound and then instructed the computer to search all of the recordings or subsets of the recordings for more clips that were like the template. Uh, these templates could be clips from a half a second, say, to maybe three or four seconds long. Next slide, please. The computer would return anywhere from a few to many thousands of clips with different templates working better than others. Here's an example of the output from that step where we've marked clips as present or not present. This one is for the song of a white crowned sparrow that breeds on uh, our coastline. Um, you can see the template up here in the upper left. Um, that's the song, uh, uh, the visual representation of the song of the white crowned sparrow. Um, and you can see with the blue checks that we've marked some of these as present. And I think you can see right off that they all look pretty much like the, uh, like the template. And that's what we were trying to do. And then you can see all these others that we marked as absent um, because they, they don't look like the template. And if you listen to them, they don't sound like the template either. Um, and those, most of these look like, uh, like juncos um, in, in the, uh, for the X's there. So this interface, by the way, is one of many innovations that we generated for the project where citizen scientists could see the clips and then easily mark them as to presence or absence. Um, and this is something that we all in this project did a lot of was uh, going through and, 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 uh, and uh, checking these, these clips. Uh, we engaged citizen scientists in these and other steps and often through bird blitzes like uh, is depicted here in the lower right corner where folks came to Point Blue headquarters uh, to learn, uh, to share insights, uh, to build data sets and also to eat good food, all thanks to NASA, the project funder. Because the tasks didn't require prior uh, expert knowledge of bird vocalizations, it brought together uh, many folks who may have never identified a bird call with others who had been birding for decades and provided this rich variety and diversity among participants, which was just a really fun thing to be part of uh, and to see. Uh, for me, uh, working with the spectrograms was a great learning experience, as I think it was for many of us, um, and gave me a whole new understanding and perspective on bird songs and calls. And because we were using a web-based platform, it allowed for people anywhere to participate. Uh, this turned out uh, to be a really big advantage when COVID restrictions took uh, hold a couple of years ago. Another big effort involving the recordings was dubbed the Golden Validation, so to drive the machine learning work that Leo will talk about next, we needed at least 500 examples of each target bird vocalization. And we needed to do detailed second by second analyses of a randomly selected set of recordings uh, for testing the accuracy of the machine learning models. This golden validation was mostly done by uh, expert citizen scientists and was one of the more challenging tasks that we undertook. So uh, many ways of using computers to analyze bird songs and calls emerged over the course of the project. And the analysis, was, uh, the, the results of the analysis became input to the more complex artificial intelligence aspects of the project, which I'm gonna turn it back over Leo to talk about now. Thanks, David. And, and we're coming back to David. Before um, I, I talk, uh, about this, um, a shout to Tiffany Erickson, who is in in the attending tonight. Is another one of the bird experts that helped us in in the project. Hi, Tiffany. <laughs> okay, so this slide has uh, a lot of stuff in there, uh, and this 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 um, start by saying this: uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, we hear a lot uh, nowadays, um, AI everywhere. All it is, is just uh, training computers to see, to be able to identify um, things in images, right? So if, if the machine is gonna drive the car, the machine is supposed to know, you know, uh, what is a car, what is a person, what is a bicycle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and be able to then uh, do something accordingly. Uh, training a machine to, to identify objects in an image is a very arduous work. And this is why we need thousands and thousands of data. And this is why this Arbimon platform 
and what David described was so important. So um, we wanted the machine to look at, and if you see the, in the bottom of the slide, some images. Um, we have their examples for anthrophony, biophony, and quiet, but also uh, on the right, bottom right, uh, spectrograms of, of bird songs. And um, you saw the ones that David was showing. And those were the things that, those little clips were the things that we used to train the machines, right? And uh, so how, do, how does this start? Well, we use these models, uh, the specific ones we use are called convolutional neural network models or CNNs. And, uh, and they, um, these, are, these are humongous models. They, uh, they were not developed by us, they were developed by um, big companies like Google, uh, trained with, uh, first with millions and millions of, of images, over a million images for sure. Uh, to try to, to make sure that the machine was able to identify shapes in those images, right? Then we take that model and we further train it with spectrograms from a public database of bird sounds. That database is called Xenocanto. Some of you, if you're birders, have heard of Xenocanto, I'm sure. Uh, and what that does is allows us to train the machine to say, hey, uh, this I'm showing you is a spectrogram. And what you see here is a shape that may belong to a, a bird song. So the machine is able to identify shapes and spectrograms. Once we did that, then we train it with the data we want to train the machine. Uh, for instance, train it with a white transparent um, clips. So the machine sees a spectrogram and sees that pattern and says, oh, this is a white transparent. Um, so it had to, it had, we had to go through this process to get to a trained AI that would help us then at, uh, scan all those 12,500 uh, minutes of, of, of recording and tell us where the machine heard uh, this species or that species or where anthrophony was uh, present and biophony was present, et cetera, et cetera. So how does that work? How's uh, this mystery AI works? Uh, and that's a graph on the top, that little sketch there. So um, when we're training the, mach the machine, we give him a clip and we say this clip, we label the clip that this is what David and the citizen scientists, uh, we, we all did actually, uh, which is basically identify a clip that says, okay, here's what I'm feeling you a white crown spiral, or in this case, a hummingbird. And that image is that, that input layer, this uh, four green dots there. But then uh, these uh, CNNs uh, use uh, um, different scalings um, in, into the image to uh, break it down into, into little pieces and then uh, uh, develop these hidden layers that are there that can be uh, 60, 80 million parameters, humongous, um, and then take very big machines to do this. And then eventually each one of those is like a little tweak, like a little uh, knob that you tweak. And, and so every time you feed it, a we train it with a white crown spiral image. It, it adjusts a little more and, or a little less those, those parameters in the hidden layers. And at the end, it comes out with an output layer. That output layer is not 80 million parameters, but 120, 250, depending on the model. So a lot more manageable. And those 250 parameters on, are, are called weights, each one of those. Uh, uh, the combination of them is what the machine uses to say, okay, now I can classify this and it's gonna be a bird, a dog, or a cat in this example, right? And so um, when we, once the machine is trained, then we come back, come back and say, okay, here's another spectrogram. Tell me what that is. Or here's another image. Tell me what you see here. In this case, uh, the model was trained. We fed it a image, a hypothetical image of a hummingbird. And the, the output comes out and says, okay, this, was, this model was trained to identify dogs, birds, or cats in images. And it says that well, of what, what you fed me, 92% chance it's a bird, okay? 7% chance is a cat, 21% chance is a bird. That output is what we use. In our case, of course, it's going to be what species of bird and a, per, a probability for that species of bird. Or if the models were about uh, the sound type, uh, what sound type and what's the probability of that sound type? That's the output we get from this AI. Um, and so once we have all this data, uh, the train models, and we, we run them with the 12,500 minutes of, of sound, we get a trove of data, millions of predictions. Uh, some of them are, are going to be 
useful. Some are not going to be that useful. So we'll filter them down or filter them out. And then we develop, uh, that's when we do the analytics. And, and so this is where I'm passing it back to David to tell you uh, an example of uh, uh, results that we had. David? So uh, this slide summarizes results from one of the land trust properties where we set out recorders. This is Glen Oaks Ranch on uh, Highway 12 in Glen Ellen, and is an example of graphics from reports that we generated for participating landowners. Um, the monitoring here took place in May 2019, which was about 20 months after the Nuns fire, and I'll come back to that. Um, and I'll note again here that these results are preliminary, as Matt did earlier. The graph on the left shows combined land cover and a 50 meter radius of each of the five Glen Oaks locations and tells us that the land cover is mostly hardwoods. It's called Glen Oaks after all, with some conifers, grasslands and chaparral cover also. The graph on the right shows the average number of species detected at each site by time of day uh, compared to Sonoma County's average. Um, and you can note here that there appears to be greater diversity at Glen Oaks Ranch than there is uh, for Sonoma County as a whole, at least for the species that we were looking at, which was not all species, uh, but a subset of about uh, 50, a little over 50. Um, on the next slide, um, we have the 10 bird species most frequently detected by the computer uh, at each of the sites uh, by time of day for the daytime hours. Uh, the y-axis shows the number of detections here. The, 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 uh, as you can see, there's a lot of variety at a site. Uh, there's a lot of variety uh, by time of day, and there's a lot of uh, variety between sites as well. And let me speak about one specific example. Um, I bird a lot at uh, Sonoma Valley Regional Park, which is more or less across Highway 12 from uh, Glen Oaks. and um, and in, up until 2017, I'm looking now at the, at the graph on the, uh, on the right that shows uh, Lazuli bunting, that LAZB is an abbreviation for Lazuli bunting, uh, as being very abundant at, at this site. Um, and I had not detected uh, um, a Lazuli bunting at uh, the regional park uh, up through 2017. And then in the spring of 2018, after the fire uh, went through there and went through Glen Oaks, they were abundant. They were all over the place and they continued to be there in 2019. So you can see that that also happened at, at, uh, at Glen Oaks. And from that, I, I, I infer, I guess, that uh, Lajulai Munting seems to like burned over areas uh, and, and occupy those uh, preferentially after a fire. Uh, so next slide. And lastly on this, um, this graphic shows the percent of time that the broader sound classes uh, that, that Rose described of anthrophony, biophony, uh, geophony, and quiet were detected on the, on the property. The blue line is showing uh, quiet, and you can see that it's pretty quiet at night, uh, but that as, as morning comes along, uh, roughly 3.30 or 4.00, the biophony ramps up and reaches a, a peak here at, at five, uh, which is something that uh, birders sometimes call the dawn chorus. Uh, the, the, the biophony continues through the day and reaches a secondary peak towards the evening. Uh, that's roughly about seven o'clock, it looks like. Um, the anthrophony uh, peaks in the earlier after, afternoon to early evening and may indicate traffic noise from Highway 12, which is uh, adjacent to, uh, uh, to Glen Oaks Ranch. And then the, finally, the green line here shows geophony peak near 3 p.m., which uh, at least jives with my experience in the Sonoma Valley that the wind picks up in the afternoon, and that may be what we're seeing there. Okay, with that, um, I will turn it uh, over to Matt. All right, thank you, David. And and Rose and, and Leo. Um, okay, so I'm back to talk about the, uh, the next steps in the project. And this involves some remote sensing. And so we're gonna dive in a little bit and talk about some new up and coming technology that uh, NASA is prototyping and how we're using these data in our project. So remember, this is all funded by NASA. So uh, there's, there's gonna be something about Earth observation in it. 
Um, and maybe some of you don't even know that, but NASA has a whole Earth observation part of the organization. You know, we often hear about rovers on Mars and you know other missions um, like the the Webb Telescope and things like that. But they also have a focus on the Earth, thankfully, to, so that we can monitor change, things like you know climate change and sea level rises, sea surface temperatures, um, and also biodiversity. So one innovative sensor that they have right now is parked on the space station. And it's a little module that plugs in to this bay in this Japanese module that's on the space station. Um, and it's called the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation. It's a mouthful, but the, the acronym is very cool. It's JEDI. And the, the play on words here is like JEDI like Star Wars because this sensor um, has a laser. So it really is a space-based laser um, that shoots out from the sensor and it's not, you don't see it. It's in a part of the spectrum your eyes don't see. It's near infrared light. And what it does is it measures um, the structure of vegetation within a column. So you can imagine like a 3D column and then me it measures the heights of vegetation, um, you know, different levels throughout that column. And it does this uh, gl almost globally and you can see here on the, the right hand side, this graph, imagine having these little columns of, of information on where the vegetation height is as you move across a landscape. And so you have this kind of profile view. You can see the terrain down here. Um, and then there's these green bands represent where there's more foliage. Okay, so here we have a lot of foliage at the top, not so much in the understory. Here we maybe have a gap in some small trees, so it's really green down below. And these graphs here are showing you vertically where all the vegetation is. So there's like a peak of vegetation here at this height. Um, here, this one has kind of two bands of vegetation here in the understory, maybe more a higher um, upper story of the canopy. This is all very interesting, um, you know, to have this kind of information. Uh, it's, it was mainly designed to do global monitoring of biomass but there's been many, many studies over the years, going back to the 50s, of how bird diversity is related to the structure of vegetation and all the different niches that that creates, different habitat within the canopy. Um, and so we're excited to use these data to get information on the structure of the habitat. So that's one new, new product that's going into our analyses. The next one is um, NASA has a new satellite that they're building. It's called the Surface Biology and Geology Mission. And this one is measuring reflected light in many, many little slices. Um, and we call these things spectral signatures. So you can get at each pixel in the image uh, a graph that looks like this, which is wavelengths of light. This is what our eyes see down here in the visible. But then there's near infrared, what we call shortwave infrared out here. And so this parts of this electromagnetic spectrum of light that we don't even see, but NASA is building a sensor that can see that. And that contains additional information beyond what our eyes can see. Um, these data are really fascinating. You can use them to um, estimate uh, basically the chemistry of the surface materials. They show some examples here with ecosystems and agriculture, you know, coastal waters. You can monitor like phytoplankton levels. You can measure snow grain size with these kinds of data, and also mineral mapping. Um, we're interested in using it to map canopy chemistry, things like water, chlorophyll levels, nitrogen, phosphorus, things that might be indicative of ecosystem health and productivity, and maybe food resources for birds. So um, we already have one paper out where we've done some what we call species distribution modeling. And this is basically a spatial model of where a given species occurs across the landscape. Uh, and that's what you see on the right. Is, so we produce these maps for each species of where we think they occur. And it's a spatial modeling framework based on a whole suite of different algorithms. I won't get into that, but we, we bring many algorithms together. So they all kind of make their predictions and we, we weight them to get a final prediction. And then to, to drive these machine learning models, we bring in uh, basically spatial maps, predictors that come out of remote sensing. So different measurements from outer space. Um, in some cases like SBG, the, the satellite's not launched yet, but what we do is we simulate it 
from data that was um, collected from an airplane that NASA flew for us. So we can kind of simulate what the satellite imagery is gonna look like. And this is an example of one of the products um, from an SBG like image, which would be like water content. So imagine some birds might be more related to where there's more water in the canopy, more potentially more food resources. We can also look at satellite data through time and get information on how the vegetation greens up, how it's like putting on leaves through the spring to its peak in the summer, and then how it starts losing its leaves. And that information has been shown in, in research to be related to bird diversity, because it, it gives information on the seasonality of the vegetation, of the habitat and the productivity of it. And then um, you have this space-based LIDAR, JEDI, that can give us the structural information about the habitat, you know, the actual physical structure. So we can bring all these different layers together in our machine learning framework and make help and drive the predictions um, as a map of where these species occur. So as I had note down here, you know, we've already done, we have one paper published uh, looking at some preliminary simulated JEDI before it was launched. We used um, data that came from an airplane that flew over Sonoma County. Um, but now we have real JEDI. JEDI is actually up on the space station right now and we have a couple years of data. So we're gonna bring that into the analysis. Um, and this is an example of the products that we're gonna produce. We're gonna update these maps um, with our new data and like real JEDI and, and, and simulated SBG data. Um, but what you get are species occurrence. So for example, spotted towhee, um, we'll get a map of probability of occurrence. So more yellow means there's higher probability, more blue means less probability. So you can see you know, spotted towhee tends to be out in the forest, not in the agricultural lands or in cities. Um, but each species will have its own map and we also be, are able to produce error uh, maps. So we kind of know where the predictions are good and where they're not so good. And these data then are really useful for conservation uh, because we can do is take each species map threshold at like pick a probability threshold, like say we just want to show where we think the bird occurs over 80%, show that as a map, and then stack all the layers together. And what you get is a species richness map. So in this example, it's, you know, it's bird species richness in this case. So just remember that looking at this map. We're not talking about all biodiversity, but just birds. And we're just talking about only 43 of our birds in this particular uh, map. This is preliminary results that were just presented at a conference in December, um, but kind of you know, prototyping our method and getting it going. And it's by a PhD student um, that's working with us, Colin Quinn. And so Colin's map shows that um, richness is high, purple, in uh, kind of areas kind of east of Sebastopol and kind of Forestville area. Uh, and then, you know, even in some of the agricultural land and then kind of in the Eastern mountains, you know, east of 101 um, have a lot of bird diversity. And then, you know, our conifer forest, redwoods and mixed conifer forests to the west are actually not that rich in birds. Um, we show low richness down here near uh, the bay, um, but you have to remember that we don't have uh, shorebirds or um, wetland birds in our data. So, um, so that's going to show low, you know, there actually could be more bird riches there, but we're just not uh, modeling those species. Okay, so this is going to be a great, you know, when we get through and get our final map of bird richness, we're excited to team up with conservation organizations and overlay protected areas and see if there's some gaps, you know, where there's high bird diversity. Uh, and maybe not much protection. And so that's gonna be a really interesting kind of follow on analysis once we get these, these maps produced. And that's ultimately the goal. And the thing with these, um, with our project, the way we designed it is because uh, it's driven with you know, bird data from the field connected to remote sensing data, the remote sensing data are dynamic and are collected over time because they're in space. And so we can get you know, multiple collections per year, sometimes a lot more than that, depending on the sensor. And as things change in the landscape, like a fire comes through, or maybe subtle change like climate change, our maps can be updated regularly. So this ultimately is a monitoring framework um, that can update through time and driven by remote sensing. And of course, if we get more data from the field, more soundscapes and so forth over time, that just helps the models. Okay, so this is the final slide. Um, we're gonna break for questions here, but I just wanna say that um, you know, we're in the phase of getting our papers out, you know, the science part, 
after all that hard work of collecting the data and building our artificial intelligence models. Uh, and we're gonna publish those papers and, and they'll, you'll find them on our Twitter account or post it on our webpage. So you can see our webpage link and our Twitter. Uh, this kind of gives you an overview of how much data we've collected at this point. And we've talked about that already. You know, a lot of citizen science hours, eight, over 8,000 hours. And that's probably an undercount because some people don't report all their hours. So, um, you know, it's just a lot of people helping to make this project successful. And we're really thankful to all of the people involved. Um, if you are interested in participating by hosting a recorder, um, we are having a very limited spring campaign. Um, we're kind of operating on fumes in the grant. Um, and there might be a chance that we can get you involved at hosting a recorder through our mail deploy program. So you can go to the webpage and sign up under the volunteer section, there's a form to fill out. Um, and we'll see if we can you know, give, you some, give you some recorders to put out. Um, okay, so now we're gonna break for questions. Thanks for your attention. We can stop the share there. Thank you, Matt, Leo, David, and Rose for sharing your research. It's fascinating to see what you guys have come up with and it's very inspiring to see this work happening right here in Sonoma County. So thank you. Um, also, thank you for all of our attendees tonight for joining this presentation. Uh, we will be doing our Q&A in just a moment for those of you who would like to stay. But if you are planning to head out at this point during the webinar, a uh, couple of quick things before you leave. We hope uh, you will continue to stay engaged with Sonoma Land Trust by following our various social media accounts and visiting our website. Attendees can also view past presentations and download educational material on our Nature at Home website or web page on our website at sonomalandtrust.org. And please keep an eye out for our monthly Language of the Land webinars. You can find a list of the webinars that are coming up on Sonoma Land Trust's website. Also, as you know, Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. If you liked what you heard today, please consider making a donation to Sonoma Land Trust. Your gift helps support land protection and preservation. If you would like to make a donation, you can do so online at Sonoma Land Trust's website, sonomalandtrust.org, by clicking the donate button. Thank you so much. In these uncertain times, we really appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. So now we can move on to Q&A. So as a reminder, if you would like to submit a question for our panelists, you can do so in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we will begin asking the panelists your questions. So let's see what we have tonight. Okay, we have a few here. So to first, let's get started here. One of our first questions is, uh, birds generate many distinctive sounds other than vocalizations. For example, hummingbirds making noise when they're in flight, their wings. Do you find these type of clips useful? David, you wanna answer that one? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we, we certainly noticed them. I mean, it was fascinating to listen to these recordings and hear all these different kinds of things, but the, the kinds of sounds that were uh, most useful were, were actual vocalizations of some kind, either a, a call or a note or a song because they tended to be uh, to be more frequent, um, and so we could we were able to to uh, we had a, a lot more to work with. Uh, only having a few sounds to work with uh, really limited the ability to to make a, a model out of that. What was the question before that one, um, Melina? About I'm sorry. Say that again. There was a question before that one uh, from also from Gina Nichols about uh, if we are collaborating with Cornell. Yes, I was going to ask that next. Would you like, I, I can repeat the question here. Um, one of the questions that came through was uh, whether or not there are any collaborations um, potentially with Cornell Ornithology. 
Yeah, well, uh, Point Blue has a long history of collaboration with um, uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, they had developed their own, as you know, they have a, a Merlin, they have a, an app that allows you to, to identify bird sounds. Um, I should add though that that, that app uh, has a little trick. And that little trick is that you need to activate your GPS so that it knows where you are. And uh, then it goes and filters and says, okay, uh, we know what kind of birds may be found in that place using eBird data. And that helps the predictor uh, narrow down the, the predictions. We, we tested that, that um, CNN uh, with our data, uh, without using the GPS, uh, of course, uh, utility. And uh, you, you get very interesting results that are not that good. But, but we have, I mean, um, every time we, we have any chance we have, of course, we, we collaborate, we ask questions, we try to learn from them, they try to learn from us. So. Yes, we're in contact with them. Thank you. We have another question tonight. Will this monitoring be done yearly to see what, if any, effects um, there are from vegetation management for wildfire? I could jump in on that one. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned that we're having a kind of limited field campaign this spring. And that campaign is really targeting areas that have burned where we've been in the past and trying to build a long-term data set and track change from, from fires. And um, we're still working on how to, we, we did uh, the spring 2021 campaign with, had that focus as well. And we revisited a lot of sites so we're already building that data set. Um, and then this spring we we're kind of targeting um, even more, maybe even going like a third time to a site. Um, so in some cases it was, it's been kind of a natural experiment uh, that we had recorders out before the fires, you know, and then the fires came. And so we can go back out and keep tracking uh, how the soundscapes change. And that's that's a, a really great opportunity for science um, that we weren't expecting when we started the project because we started before even the 2017 fires. So, uh, but it's one of those things that we kind of, you know, adapted and adjusted over time. So a deep those natural experiment. Yeah. Thank you for answering that, Matt. We have another question here. What are this, What are some of the parameters that influence relative bird biodiversity? You wanna, I, I, can, I can speak for what I know, but I'm, I'm sure um, Matt and David will, will also, please jump in. So Matt, Matt described the most important ones for sure, right? That, that is the, the structure of, the type of vegetation, the structure of vegetation that is there. Um, at a larger scale, then we start looking at climate covariates. And this is something that is in that paper that Matt was mentioning. We actually examined at what scale what parameters become more important, right? Uh, but um, so it, that, that, that question is, well, yes, what type of what land cover is there? Um, and at what scale you're looking? And uh, it may be some of the things become important. Yeah, I, can, I can jump in on that too. You mentioned it, Leo, like the climate part is really important. Um, so at like a, the finer scale, there's the vegetation, but what we found in our model, like the, that preliminary and that or the analysis we already published uh, had climate variables that I didn't even talk about, but it had things like precipitation and temperature um, going back several years. And those variables actually came out to be very important in, in the models. Um, and then there were certain guilds of species like that were like conifer specialists that tended to be really influenced by forest structure, for example, um, and also like shrubland specialists as well. But at a broader level, it was like climate. The climate envelope is a really big driver. And that's found with other species distribution models too. When you look at the literature, it wasn't a big surprise. Thank you. Let's see here. Here's another question. Um, have we seen any changes on soundscapes during COVID-19? Also, what about during windstorms? Great question, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know that um, uh, it would be more perhaps if there are 
uh, would be on the sound types, right? They, they would be more quiet because people are not going out more and they can more, you know, traveling so much and humming and with the vehicles. But I, that that would affect the diversity. Uh, I don't know that it would. So Colin Quinn, our PhD student, has a paper that's just about to be published, just got back from revision and it's out for review again. And um, and he did start looking at that question of like, was there a dip in like anthropophony during COVID? Um, but it was really difficult because we didn't, um, there's all these other confounding factors at work, like land cover, um, as well as like distance from roads and different, we actually switched recorder types during the, we started off with this like smartphone approach and then switched to audio moss. So there was, it's a great, great question. And there have been a couple papers that have come out about how COVID has affected soundscapes and made things quieter. You know, during that period, that really intense period where everything locked down. And then of course everything opened up again, but like in that spring 2020, things were very quiet. And um, so it was hard for us to tease it apart with our data. Um, but yeah, I think there's something there. I think the fire is probably gonna have more of a, a more drastic change to the soundscapes. <clears throat> is there any preliminary data that you can share about pre, um, pre and post fire data? A good question. Yeah, not yet, right? <laughs> I'm trying to think. <laughs> so again, yeah. back to Colin, that's like one of his PhD dissertation topics is to look at change from fire. And he's about six months out from even starting that analysis. So, um, so there's kind of a data embargo right now until we do the analysis, but eventually these are all public domain data. It's collected with federal funding. It's citizen science data. So it will be published and uh, open to the public. So stay tuned. Yeah, and, and contact us. If, you, if there's somebody out there that asked that question that wants to get involved, yeah, we're open for you know, collaborations and, and collaborative science, definitely. Okay, I have a two-part question for the team here. Are you collecting birdsong data in Sonoma City? And then the next question here is, are also, how do you choose the bird species you decide to focus on? I, th I think that Sonoma County um, is what the reference is. Um, and the answer is yes, uh, mostly in Sonoma County. There were a few uh, locations in Marin and Mendocino, right, uh, Matt? Um, yes. And, yeah, Mendes, you know, even up in near Shasta, we had, we tried it out a little bit as well. But and in terms of, yeah, in terms of the species that we decided to focus on, it, it really had a lot to do with those that we, uh, that we could um, um, model, that, that, that we could get results out of the machine. Uh, and it was a lot of trial and error to see which, which sounds uh, of any particular species would work uh, in the machine. And, and, and which species then were, were, we were able to, to continue working with. And, and some things work better than others. Um, and, and some sounds uh, for a species work better, like song sparrow, for example. A song sparrow has a very complicated, each, each song sparrow has a, a set of complicated songs. And it, it's very hard to, uh, to pick one. Uh, and it turned out that the, the, the thing that worked was a little note that they make, this little bzzz sound that they make, and that's very reproducible. Um, so that was, that was the way that we worked with Song Sparrow, but it really, it depended very much on the species and it depended on what worked and what didn't work. And some, some worked well and others not so well. We have another question here. Have any policy, uh, have any policymakers expressed interest in using your data to inform their legislation? Well, <laughs> no, I, I would say that um, there, the, the data that informs policy comes further down river than this. When this is something that Matt was letting, uh, leading to in this future directions where we start looking at changes in the landscape, uh, the impact of fires, uh, 
identifying areas that uh, are unique and very special, right? That we managed to hit with one of these recorders, right? Um, and we are, I mean, it's it's something that we are going to do. We're going to talk. We only take it so long, so far, right? We we say, hey, we found this. Could you do something about it? <laughs> uh, and that's that's uh, as far as we we will go. But yeah, so we this is. Uh, uh, I think the value of science is in how it changes society, right? Uh, this is NASA thinks this way. We all think this way. So we hope that we get there. And, and kind of piggybacking on that is one thing you should remember that we, we designed this project with a, a global perspective. So we're trying to develop a method that can be applied in other regions. Um, where maybe you have citizen scientists involved, maybe not. I mean, you can still like use this technology, putting out the recorders, and you know, connect it to remote sensing. And we have an eye on like this broader goal of having kind of revolutionizing the way we monitor biodiversity through space and um, you know, with space-based assets. So I think you know, it just this is going to be science that contributes to the larger conversation about how biodiversity is changing and beyond just Sonoma County. Uh, you know, across the state, nationally, so forth. It adds to the data, the information. Thank you. Another question is, have you correlated changing bird populations to our recent droughts, to our recent drought, both numerically and geographically? No, it's a great, it's a great analysis to do. Um, I think some of that might come out when we do our species distribution modeling, because we will feed the models annual maps of um, water of precipitation. So we have this great data set that comes from the USGS where they model precipitation and temperature on an annual basis. So some of our modeling might show that some species you know, are sensitive to that, but we don't have a, a planned side analysis on drought in particular, but that'd be great. Matt, we should, uh, we should do mention though that um, there, there is a, a year effect that we have detected in the data, right? So um, there are things we measure that seem to vary uh, from year to year, right? Um, um, I believe some of this, Colin has found in the sound types, um, but but yes, we it's way too preliminary to say anything, and we haven't really looked into it. You know, so many great things to do now that we have the data. <laughs> it's taken us a long time to get to the, the state where we can actually predict the birds and these different soundscape components. Um, a lot longer than we thought, and so and uh, we've evolved along the way. Like we actually started off with not doing um, this artificial intelligence, but some more rudimentary machine learning algorithms. And then we adopted this technology as we learned more about it throughout the project. So it's been exciting for us. We've all learned a lot um, about the, this technology. It's relatively new. Thank you. Another question we have here is about algorithms. So for your algorithms, how did you ensure that they were accurate and not um, confusing some species with other species? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Great questions. All right. Uh, and and I um, we go back to that golden validation that David was mentioning, right? Um, so um, when when we use our Arvimont to 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 find this pattern for us for for us, it, it it by doing so it filters. It actually is looking for things that look like that. And so the model is, uh, uh, as we say, is overfit on those patterns. So if you test the model only with taking some of those patterns that Arvin found, holding them on the side, training the model, and then asking to predict on those, it will predict very well. And it does. Because, <laughs> because they're, they're all part of the same bag of, of clips that were found by the Arvin uh, algorithm. So what? David did and with uh, uh, other experts is to listen to uh, nearly 600 minutes 
of recording. That's that's a lot of time. And annotating in every second that they heard a bird uh, call of the ones we used to train the machine. And annotating, I heard this call in this second of this clip, second by second on those 600 minutes. And those were minutes selected at random that had nothing to do with the clips used to train the model. And when you test the models against, against those, uh, they don't do that well. And this is uh, true for us and true for Merlin, <laughs> unless, unless Merlin has the, the GPS set in. Um, it's, it's, it, it, we, um, it is a, it's universal, I think. Um, uh, it's a pr problem more complex than we should be talking about here. But, um, but we, uh, we use that information to penalize the model. Uh, and what does that mean? We say, well, we're going to only take the most, the highest probability outputs out there, even if it means that we're going to miss many detections, right? So we say only remember the slide with the prob probability of bird, dog, and cat, right? Um, well, we're going to take only things that, that, um, that are predicting at 99%. We didn't do this for the report, by the way. It's preliminary, the report, but we, that was a pass through. It, there was a filter in that report, but it was not very stringent. Uh, we're working on making it even more stringent. Uh, but uh, we say you need to first clear this hurdle. That prediction is to be, you need to be at least 99% certain. The model needs to be 99% certain at least before we can say the species was detected there, right? In that clip, in the two seconds. That's one. Then after that, we also use those golden validations to uh, develop uh, uh, after the fact corrections. So the birds, if you hear, hear it in this minute singing, that bird must have been singing in prior minutes and probably singing in, post, in following minutes. Also, you will hear other birds that should be there where that bird was singing. Typically are there with that bird where the bird lives. And we use that additional information to put another layer of correction to make sure that we get a, a prediction. Again, this is not yet in the reports. The reports had a, a different type of a more lenient filter, but we're going to get there eventually. Okay. We, um, so that's how we make sure that, try to make sure that, that, um, that we get the right thing. And this is, by the way, universal. This is not just birds and detecting birds. This is uh, your COVID test for example, has this problem. And they, they try to make it so that it reaches a certain level to say, okay, you are not infected. <laughs> so what Leo explained is a real novel um, kind of post, we call it the post-classification correction um, that has, we haven't seen that in, in the literature in this particular domain with, with species detection of actually taking the predictions and using the temporal aspect of the predictions of like, we heard the bird before, we heard the bird after, maybe half an hour before and a half an hour after and using that to help cull out false predictions. And so we're excited about that. It's gonna be a new innovation that we're working on the paper right now. We've got all the graphs, we just need to finish it up, but uh, that's gonna be neat. I think that'll be a really a, a good um, innovative thing that comes out of this project. One other question we have tonight is asking if you can reiterate how you plan to use this data. What will you do with it when you are done? You want me? I can. Well, I I showed the one example with. Uh, finally, we get these models, the spatial models. Then there's all these conservation applications of these maps and being able to see where different bird species occur or don't. And first of all, that's that's just really good scientific knowledge of kind of what's driving, what are the driving factors of biodiversity across the landscape and how that may change with different disturbance like fire. Um, but also from the conservation perspective of being able to see maybe where, where some species are, are not well protected and others are maybe where we need kind of more corridors. I saw there was a question about the Sonoma Development Center, for example. I think this would be a great, approach to put sound recorders, you know, in that corridor that connects across Sonoma Valley to be able to, to track 
biodiversity, not just birds, but um, you know, other animals that vocalize. And, and Point Blue is actually looking into uh, using this to uh, identify good farming practices. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can monitor uh, um, if, we, if we have a, a set of, of practitioners and how they use the land uh, and we have the, the proper control experiment using these devices, we can automate this and apply the large scales and collective data to, to actually propose then uh, solutions that increase biodiversity in working lands, which is what we want. And we have had interest, for instance, from uh, um, this is, um, I believe it's Marine Land Trust, who, oh no, it's not Marine Land Trust, it's, a, uh, it's an ag organization in Marine that would like to see this as well, so. One other question we have tonight is, did you get any non-avian animal sounds on the recorders, either mammalian or insect? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what's part of the biophony uh, uh, artificial intelligence model that we built. It actually included sounds from not just birds, but insects, amphibians, mammals like cows, lots of cows. Um, all of those were folded into that biophony class. So I, I think in our talk, we might've kind of loosely kind of showed that that's kind of birds, you know, there's a dong chorus and so forth, but that biophony graph that data showed, David showed was really, you know, it was amphibians and everything right. that was right. vocalizing. And, and one of the interesting things from the, from the uh, spectrograms is uh, that you can see things that you can't hear. Um, so uh, my hearing is limited now to about eight kilohertz or so at the top end, um, and it's dropping, it seems. <laughs> and, and you can look on the spectrograms and you can see that there are things happening up there, for, you know, above eight and all the way up to, to 20 or 24, which is the top end. So some, some bird vocalizations actually can cover a huge range from you know two to twenty or something like that, but there are other things that are only vocalizing uh, above eight or ten, and we could see them, but we couldn't hear them and couldn't really identify uh, what what they are. Um, and that was pretty common. And they they appeared to be insects. These were repetitive noises, kind of like cicadas that we could hear um, that got down into the range where we could hear, but other things that we just don't know exactly, but they definitely had a pattern looking like insects, but some bird vocalizations too that get up there. Um, yeah, and lots of cows. There were, there were many cows. Uh, there were lots of dogs barking. Um, there were roosters crowing. I mean, we had, there was quite a variety of- People stuff. talking. Yeah, a baby crying talking. that sounded like, uh, what was the bird that it sounded yeah, like? Yeah, a mountain quail. Mountain uh, <laughs> yeah. Kids shrieking uh, sounded, we're, we're, we're called mountain quail. So uh, we definitely had, you know, had some, some uh, interesting uh, cross, uh, I, some misidentifications uh, along those lines. Um, one, thing we should, one thing we should note also is that the audio mosque could actually go up to the frequencies where you could detect bats but we limited in our, our artificial intelligence models, the frequency range. And so we're not detecting bats in our data, but that's another application. There's, there's another thing that might've been, been recorded in there that, that we yeah. didn't really hear. So yeah, they, they, were, they were fascinating. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on and we really had to uh, you know, not get distracted sometimes by all the cool stuff uh, and, and try to get the, you know, get the focus down to, to being able to detect these 50 or so species that, that, uh, that we ended up with. Sounds like it kept you on your toes. Oh boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've come a long ways. <laughs> so we have another question about location. Um, in Sonoma County, are there any places where you would like to place a recorder, but you have not had the opportunity or much participation in a particular area? Hmm. We still have some gaps, honestly, out in the um, kind of northwest of the county and north, really the north of the county. Uh, there's just large tracts of privately owned land um, that we didn't get recorders out to. And we tried last spring. Rose did an amazing job of like mailing people letters, seeing if they wanted to participate. 
And, you know, we only got a certain percentage of response back from that, but we, even with those efforts, like in our mail deploy approach where we just mail you the recorders and you send them back, um, we still have some data gaps. So do uh, you guys have anything to add? I would love to see more data from the uh, upper parts of the Guadalajara River, for example. Mm -hmm. A beautiful area. I think we need more, we need also in, in general, we need more agriculture and urban. That's a thing we've been, we've been really focused in, like we presented at Pepper, we presented here at Sonoma Land Trust and kind of more of a natural lands focus maybe, but this is a countywide project and um, we made efforts to get more, you know, vineyards and, and houses, people's backyards, but we could use more of that as well. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that map regarding um, farmland, agricultural land versus urban areas? Are there any differences you've been seeing in the kinds of data that's collected or how you collect that data? The, 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 the main analysis so far has been from Colin, our grad student, who has this anthropophany, biophony, geophony paper. Um, I mean, gosh, this is a whole other, <laughs> get Colin here to give the whole spiel, but um, he has some really interesting results about from different land cover types of how these broad categories vary. And, and urban areas have, of course, a lot of anthropophony, but they actually have a pretty distinct biophony signal of like a dawn chorus. And that was kind of a surprise for me. I mean, and when you think about it, yeah, okay, you go out from your house in the morning, you know, I live in a suburb and you do hear birds and we're all taking the kids off to school, the birds are yakking. And so, but that was neat to see that there is this biophony signal. It's following, it's an urban ecosystem and it's kind of mimicking, you know, what a more natural wildland is doing as well. But it does have, you know, a bigger pulse of anthropophony in there as well. Agriculture, was also more anthropophony. Maybe I think it actually had less biophony than uh, machinery. Urban. Yeah, it was machinery. The machinery, yeah. But there Absolutely. wasn't a big dawn chorus. Like I think the urban areas were even more, which was encouraging. It, you know, this might be just a few species that are doing all the vocalizations, and that's something that we'll get to with our data with the birds that we haven't fully analyzed yet. We have a question on artificial intelligence. Can you elaborate on how much the integration of vocalizations with image recognition increases the discrimination, the discriminating power of AI? Yeah, I would like to jump in here, Matt. Yeah, and do it. David, just you know, and Rose, and and also the next one uh, where we, we we're looking at widely for tools that may help this work. Uh, so. Um, we are uh, one of our, our colleagues working in this project is is uh, Dr. Sean Newsom, uh, uh, UC Merced's computer scientist, and and the models were initially fit by his uh, PhD student, uh, Shishal Baligar, and and uh, they have lots of experience with AI, all sorts of models, very complex models, more complex than the ones we're using here, even. And and one thing that they acknowledge immediately is that. Um, these things are so complex, 80 million parameters, 120 million parameters, that the scientists themselves really don't understand what the machines are doing. This is, um, and, and there's a lot of investment really these days in mathematics and, and computer science to try to understand really what these models are doing. Um, but the way they explain this to us, this how AI works, is as if you're trying to teach a, a machine to learn a new language, right? So when we started with these models, these models could speak, let's say, English. They were trained with more than a million images to identify shapes and names of shapes in those images, right? So they could say, okay, I, it could, they could say car, boat, dog, right? So um, we introduced a new set of objects for this machine to learn how to, how to name those things, right? And those were the spectrograms that we used. So we start first with uh, the Xenocanto ones, and those were to say, okay, I see that this is a spectrogram of a bird. <laughs> right? So the machine now knows a little more. And then we get into specifics. Okay, now that you know that the spectrogram is a bird, 
Uh, now we're going to tell you what bird is if, if you look at the spectrogram. So we give them the labeled data that David and explain how we did with citizen science to collect. And those labeled data says, okay, all these spectrograms are the background sparrow, the example he was showing. And then machine learns, oh, okay, next time I see spectrogram, something that looks like this, I know it's a white crown sparrow and I can say white crown sparrow. So that's how, um, um, how you know, we increase the knowledge of, of those machines by training them further and further. As to the, the person who mentioned this about the gazillions of efforts, yes, everybody is doing AI, believe me. We are part of uh, AI for Earth with Microsoft that we got actually, it's really got a, got a grant uh, from Microsoft to do this. Uh, some work on this. We are also part of uh, another uh, 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 institution's efforts in this, is uh, the McGovern Foundation. And they have hundreds of people doing AI uh, of all sorts of things, not just biology. They, we, 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 people are documenting languages, for instance. There's a guy from the University of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia studying uh, lost languages in Russia, for example. There's all sorts of stuff. The knowledge, sadly, most of the time is not transferable. And this is a problem with Merlin, the, that application from Ebert. They trained it with some data, but once you take it out of the context within which it was trained, it will fail unless you put that GPS, right? And so um, there is a, a certain amount of this uh, that is not transferable. And these models have, um, they, they have evolved into things that, that computer science is a very fast paced field. And these models were created five years ago. They're, they call them already old. You go figure. So, um, but we do, you know, uh, it, we are more, our job here is not so much to um, make great AI. Our job here is to uh, find ways we can monitor biodiversity uh, at large scales. Thank you, Leo. Our very last question for tonight, we have lots of questions, but we're going to have to end now. Um, so the very last question is, how can new volunteers get involved? Um, Matt, you had mentioned possibility of placing recorders on private properties. Are there other opportunities for people in the community to become involved in this work? Yeah, at the high level, you can visit our web page and um, sign up to host a recorder. and. Um, the, we, Rose is no longer uh, coordinating the field team this year. She did an amazing job. You saw all the data we got last spring. So we're doing this on like a shoestring. I'm basically managing it from my lab. So um, we'll try and hook people in as best we can, but um, that's, that's the way to get involved. We're no longer doing the RBMON spectrogram analysis because we've got enough data to do what we need to do and, and, and finish the project. Uh, on the point blue side, or do you have opportunities, Leo? Um, yeah, well, but um, not. <laughs> well, maybe um, it's, it's stay in touch because, uh, as I said, we're we're looking to perhaps bringing this to uh, Aglands. Um, we we're putting uh, recordings, uh, recording devices there. We also um, we tried to do this uh, with NASA, but uh, we're now partnering with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to um, do this also in the Sierra, Sierra Nevada. We have th uh, thousands of records uh, from bird counts, from uh, point counts, and now we want to uh, extend that, that effort using uh, these recordings. So we're, we're starting on the other end. We already have recordings. So we're trying to uh, extend our model to work with uh, those data. But eventually, we may want to also put the effort of putting recorders out there. So if you if you don't mind if you don't mind driving to some thick, really remote location in the CRS and hiking a little bit and then putting a device, stay in touch. <laughs> it sounds like visit the website and and contact you if if people are interested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've come to the end of our time together this evening, and I just want to thank our panelists here for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mariana, for your interpreting services, and thank you to the whole community who attended tonight's presentation. We're really glad to have you and be able to offer this presentation. 
We hope you stay connected with Sonoma Land Trust. So have a lovely rest of your evening. And Thanks, Melina, everybody. thank you for hosting. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for hosting. Thank Good you. job, Melina. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.